Hi everyone, uh, welcome to another episode of my podcast. Uh, today I have a, a great guest all the way from Colombo, Sri Lanka. I have Misha from Whirlwind. Hi Misha. Hi Masan. Hi Bohan. <laughs> Hi Bohan. Hi Bohan. <laughs> In a while. Uh, yeah, long time, long time. Because I think last time I saw you was like 2016. 16. Yeah, Maelstrom. Oh, yeah. Maelstrom. Okay, ne? <laughs> How are you doing, Majan? And that was a comeback kick. Uh, I'm doing good, bro. Actually, uh, nothing to complain about except for, you know, like uh, the COVID, uh, you know, pandemic, uh, you know, issues that everybody is facing, you know. Oh. But uh, I'm more free because no gigs, <laughs> you know, like, and more free to kind of like explore new things. So, been pretty good doing a little bit of gardening with mom and, you know, <laughs> that's kind of things are happening. So, more time to, you know, like actually spend time with, you know, actually spend time with family and, you know, like, so that's something I normally don't get to have with my lineup of work, you know, either if I tour with my other projects or even if I'm here, it's always, it's always about practicing and, you know, gigs mm. and organizing gigs and all that. So, it's been pretty good. Are you getting any, from all this chaotic situation, are you getting inspiration for new songs and stuff? Yes, pretty much. Already. Because we are in the middle of recording Whirlwind's third album, you know, in the middle of that. But it came into a uh, standhold because uh, two months ago when they had this whole curfew situation going on. So for a band like us, it's always about meeting the members, sitting with, you know, Chunky and Chandu and, and Crescent, you know, like for us, it's always about jamming, you know, hanging out, you know, and that's that's what we create our music, you know, with inspiration. Why do we, you know, without meeting up, you know, recordings won't happen. Like for us, we need to kind of like meet up even mm -hmm. some of the stuff we have already done, but we are not recorded. In the, we, when we sit down for recording, me and Chunky, basically we need to kind of like do something with it, you know, like change some things, but we can't do that also because we can't meet up. Mm. So because of that, uh, since we can't meet up, it gave me some time to kind of like concentrate on writing new lyrics, basically, you know, and writing new tunes, new ideas, you know, and, and also exploring new, um, you know, like collaboration opportunities also, you know, mm. like Whirlwind has always been a project that is like, it carries inspiration from everybody around us. It's it's like what it says, you know, like it's nothing that much of planned, you know, it's very natural, you know, it, it's very intuitive, you know, like it's not like we, we try so hard to do the band and we mm. try, you know, but keep our goals, but we know uh, like the uncertainties, you know, and we know, you know, like it's not like we have an industry here. We don't have an industry for the music that we do. So, so right now I'm getting inspiration, you know, getting more time to write new concepts, you know, and uh, also working with my other music projects, you know, like there's more time to explore ideas, you know, because mm -hmm. you're not in that, you know, schedule and you're not into that practice schedule and you're not into, okay, planning this gig or having a meeting with the sponsor, you know, like, so that scene is, you know, like completely stuck for two months to you know, close to three months. So it's given more opportunity to explore new uh, new things, you know, and new tunes, you know, like, especially with my other projects. So I'm expanding that also. So mm. it's been it's been interesting. It's always is, you know, especially when you're a musician. Right? Yeah. So what I realized when the when they locked down everything and all that, Machang, uh, how fragile the system is. Everything is quite yeah. fragile, right? It can everything can fall apart, like. The, the things that finally matter is just, you know, your family and your relationships. And uh, also, I really admire, I really felt that because we, 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 we dive in music, we love music, that actually helps us to sort of survive this period, right? Otherwise, if we are like, we'll be like depressed. <laughs> <laughs> it could be not as like I was thinking the other day if it weren't for if, if I wasn't a musician see I, I was a producer uh, also for since uh, 2007 to 2012 I was a I was one of the highest paid producers in the country working in advertising industry so right uh, if if this would have happened you know at a time like that I think I would have gone mad you know <laughs> like because then I was not more attached with music you know like more in a working mindset, you know, but because 
right now I'm a musician and like full time musician mm. that is like you know my other stuff I feel like fuck you know like I have like a lot of good things I can do right now because I can occupy myself with so many good things you know like still I'm learning you know like still I'm exploring a lot of things in my instruments you know guitar playing and, and even I'm exploring drums I'm exploring other instruments by myself you know like keyboards and all that so yeah <laughs> <laughs> For a musician, it never gets old, you know, like, no matter what happens, there's always something to do, like, you know, mm. even if you don't play gigs, you know, like, for us, I think, without music, without having music in our lives, I don't think we would have survived this, like, yeah. this staying in one place for three months, <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, so, so, Misha, uh, I know that, uh, I think I first saw you maybe 2002 or 2003, those days, right, on the Rock Saturday, those uh, gigs, but... But can you tell me a little bit about your childhood and then uh, how did you discover the, like, you know, music and metal? Uh, well, for me, I was, so basically I, I grew up in Dubai, you mm. know, like as, as I was, yeah, I, I, I went, I was raised in Dubai. So up until, uh, till I was nine to 10 years old, I, I didn't come back to Sri Lanka, you know, like I, I so basically I had to come back to Sri Lanka with my mom. My whole family was there. Uh, so when I came down here, I couldn't speak a word of Sinhalese, you know, like I didn't, like I was, I was only speaking Hindi, Arabic and English, you know, those were the main three languages that I was raised up in Dubai. Right. So when I came down here, it was completely, you know, like, and then I had to go to school here in Colombo. And when I went to school there, so it was quite interesting for me. And it was also, you know, very hard times in the country, you know, with the war. Yeah. going on so the experiences i've had you know i think as a child coming down to the island from there i think that kind of like ignited the inspiration to do something i didn't know it was music or whatever so i was raised like that you know so then you know like i was raised with because my dad wasn't with us back then you know like he was working in dubai so me and my mom had to come so it was like for me and my mom so i'm the only child so mm. i grew up alone with my mom you know like uh, and uh, relation wise you know like we have very few relations you know and and uh, you know like our, where i hail from this country is like you know my dad's um, uh, land is in from anuradhapura from the north mm, right so the so we were like very isolated you know <laughs> in in colombo you know like we had very few relations so and since i was a lonely only child so i had to like uh, didn't have much friends, only a few neighbor friends and all that, but inspiration from school, you know, and uh, then growing up in war, I remember, you know, like even when my mom sent me to school, you know, it was like, uh, there were times like she sent me to school thinking that she might not see me mm. again, or maybe I'll end up in a body bag or either we might not even have enough parts to even fill in a body bag, you know, right. the, you know, city bombings and all that. So I remember I was, um, there was few uh, while I was schooling and while I was doing A levels and all that. I lost few friends also uh, for this castle bomb blast, you know. And it was our big matches happening, and you know, and then we were doing hat collections, and you know, that was that was one turning point where I started kind of like uh, getting my influence into music, you know, because my dad was an artist, you know, he's mm. a painter. He worked for garment press here locally, and then he was working for the garment press in Dubai, so. Uh, still to this day, the the, um, the boat racing and the horse racing logos in Dubai, you know, the logos were designed by my dad. Right. So, uh, so his inspiration was, he, he he's a flutist, not a professional musician. He plays instruments, you know, he plays the mouth organ and, and he has, he plays the keyboards, like, you know, like Shanta and those kind of, you know, stuff, you know, he wasn't a trained keyboardist or anything. So I think my first inspiration for music came from him, you know, then, you know, I was touching upon his keyboards and you know and then the music that we had in our home because of all the tapes that he was sending you know from uh, eagles to you know tapes of abba tapes of you know like and the western you know music influence was there because of all the music that my dad was sending me from abroad because he couldn't you know you know like see, see me grow up you know right. since uh, 1989 uh, you know like I haven't, you know, like met my dad until 1996, seven, you know, until then. So it was like we, I grew up, you know, apart from. Him. So, um, 
Yeah, so then uh, for music inspiration, I think yeah, starting from there and then I remember uh, he bought me my first guitar. Uh, then I was tall as the guitar actually. Because I, <laughs> then I couldn't play that guitar. I, I remember it was in Dubai. When I was in Dubai, I, I saw it in the showroom and I wanted a guitar. So he bought me this guitar. That was the only guitar he bought me. You know, like that's the only thing he said. I, I'm going to buy you, you know, guitars because I don't know whether you do it. You know, like, mm. and uh, the only thing I did was I didn't play it. Like I didn't go for any classes or anything. But you know, I was just you know. But when I came down to Sri Lanka, I was doing arts myself in school because you have to choose. You know, like mm. it's when you're doing all of those, also you either you choose art or either you do choose you know like music. So I chose uh, art in school, but I had the inspiration for music. So I went for a class to learn the fiddle, the violin, you know, mm. but that's the, the Eastern, you know, uh, you know, music culture. So there, while playing the violin, you know, I love playing fisicato because it's like plucking the strings. So because I learned the violin, I translated whatever I learned from the violin to the guitar I had. Well, then I started tuning the guitar, then I learned to tune the guitar. So then I moved away from the violin and, you know, then I was, you know, playing the guitar, you know, then Clarence Milton songs because I was growing up in a Sinhalese background, you know, like with my friends in school, you know, right. very less people in my school, you know, it's President's College, Rajagiri. So the influence wasn't that much of an English background influence, you know. So the background was more Sinhalese oriented background, you know, listening to Gunadasa Kapuge, you know, like when you started, right. you know, and, you know, so those kind of influences, you know, and then, you know, um, that's where I started the guitar, you know, I, I'm, I'm very really proud to say that because, you know, I started playing Clarence's songs, you know, and that was my first inspiration, you know, it's not like I started with Beatles or anything, although right. I heard. And, you know, and then slowly, slowly into, I went into classic rock music, you know, and, and learned by myself, you know, the guitar. Then I tried to go to a few classes, which didn't work out because when I go to classes, it's, it was very, I don't know, even at that time, the guitar classes were very mediocre. You know? Right, right. It wasn't like, you know, like I was growing up watching ITN and, you know, like the music club music, you know, like chart shows and all that. So what you saw in then, you know, like, and you saw Queen, you know, mm. and you saw these kind of you know, sounds and, you know, like we tried to play those kind of things. And that was not the background I was getting. So I remember I had a card in uh, British Council. The only time I went to British Council. So I had a library card. So what I did was I stole a book. I haven't returned it still to this day. <laughs> so, okay. That was a guitar book. So it's all, you know, guitar uh, teachings and all that. So that book was my first guide into scales and, you know, and yeah, in 1995, 94, you know, like the school, you know, like when I was like grade seven and, you know, eight, uh, started, you know, playing around with uh, my dad's keyboards, you know, like uh, it was with me, you know, some he had sent me and some were kept here and some he had in Dubai. So whatever was here, uh, Yamaha PSR 20, 520, yeah, that was the keyboard. So, with that, I formed a small band, you know, it wasn't World Wing, you know, 94 with, you know, like cool friends and, and then we had to, we made a drum kit from T-Box and X-Tray, you know, right, right. Friends, you know <laughs> so, uh, the bicycle hub hi-hat, you know, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Really. and um, yeah, I think that was the first kind of, you know, and then we started, you know, jamming you know, a little bit of English songs, you know, Beatles, you know, mostly Beatles, you know, actually what was, and, and, and a little bit of Bob Marley here and there. And um, so then I stumbled upon, you know, like, like trying to play, you know, like everybody else, like Hotel California and all that stuff. Right. So, but at the same time, you know, I started writing songs, you know, and I only knew two scales when I started properly. So I wrote about, I remember I wrote about, 20 songs, you know, and we kind of like jammed those songs. And it was not just uh, Sinhalese music, it was Sinhalese and it was like Sinhalese English mixed kind of music also, you know, like we were just jamming, you know, then 90, towards the end of 95, you know, only Whirlwind kind of like came into play, you know, mm -hmm. then uh, we, at that time, we, my school friends and, you know, the initiators, we wanted to name the band Wind. Wind. I remember. Then my dad walked in 
to the practice room because it's the same house I'm in right now also. So, uh, so he came into the room and he asked me, what is the name of the band? So I said, we think of naming it Win. And it's like a bad idea. Like Haryana. <laughs> <You know? laughs> like, it's a really bad idea. It's, you can't name band Win. And then he, then he came with the dictionary and he circled out, I remember World Wind. After the practice session, he came and he sat with me and another two members at the time, you know. Like, what do you think of this? So I was like, uh, I didn't know what it was until, you know, I read the dictionary. I was like, ah, oh, well, it sounds like a pretty cool name. Mm -hmm. But we weren't, a, you know, like, we, weren't think, we weren't a metal band. Huh? We, weren't, we were just a band that was forming to do, like, originals. The only idea was, yeah, let's do originals. So we had about right. 20 originals we were jamming. And some <coughs> of them sounded like rock, but we didn't know what it sounded like because it was coming out of a tea box and, you know, like, and even I didn't have an electric guitar. I was going through uh, my box guitar and I had a karaoke setup, I remember. So I had stuck the karaoke mic onto mm. my uh, V-cut, this guitar. So it just hangs in the bridge there. So what happens is when you, in the karaoke setups, you have this echo, you know, effect. Mm. So when you increase the echo effect and the volume, the guitar gets distorted. So when you put on the headphones, you don't hear the acoustic tones. You only hear what gets distorted and the echo that comes in. That was my first, you know, in 95, I remember that was my first, you know, like distortion kind of tone. Right. I learned Hotel California through a cassette. And I remember going to, uh, I don't know whether you know this record bar. We in a record bar in, in Bumble Pitya, PIS place. That's the first time I met him, like the smoke shop where we go in right, Bumble right. Pitya. That's the only place where you could go and um, get... Uh, songs recorded into a cassette, you know, like okay. Eagle. So I remember he gave me the, a few Eagle albums, you know, into cassettes. And uh, after practicing Hotel California and some of these things, you couldn't listen to the song because the tape was gone. It was rewind forward, rewind forward, you know, like it was born. I remember going and getting this playlist done, you know, like telling him, give me, you know, like do another copy of it, do another copy because that's how... I learned, you know, that's how I had to, you know, go by, you know. And um, so that was the initiation of, you know, and then uh, I remember towards the end of uh, uh, 95 and the beginning, uh, yeah, about February 96, 97, we had the chance to perform, you know, a few shows. By that time, we had performed a few shows like Commerce Days, um, English Days, you know, right. in our school. And we were gaining good popularity because of the originals we had, you know. So it's just like we had an original called, you know, Whirlwind itself, you know, it talks about, you know, uh, you know a little bit of, you know, uh, a blind man's perspective, you know, to uh, the society, the love and, and kind of like introduction to what pain would be like, you know, for growing up, you know, and then, you know, like Kala Dushti kind of songs, we named it like, uh, so which initially turned out to be the three metal songs, it evolved, you know, like it started right. off as plastic, but by the time we recorded in 2003 in Torana, those songs had progressed into metal songs, you know, like very heavy songs, you know, with, uh, because then only I remember I got my first guitar pedal, a Zoom guitar pedal, and that was also from a friend in school who gave me that. And then, how, how, um, how did that progression happen, like from a regular song to becoming it metal and then uh, you're, you're discovering that three metal sound? Uh, it started with Deep Purple. I remember okay. listening to all this uh, uh, and I had a friend in SLBC who was very elder to me, who was actually a fan of our band and who also supported the band back in the day. Uh, he, uh, Tilina, Tilina Samarasuriya. So he often, you know, came to visit the band and he was, he had guitar amplifiers he had a proper drum kit also he you know like he then again you know brought that to the house and all that so then he brought deep purple and i remember he cop he brought few cds and from deep purple and black sabbath and you know so when i heard this song deep purple first when i heard deep purple the only thing it struck me was i'm never going to play this kind of music like you know this is too extreme this is after listening to deep purple smoke on the water for the first time that, that was in like 96, beginning of 96 or something. Right. And then only it started growing to us, you know, like, okay, then 
you started listening to your playlist, it's there on Vinamp, your playlist, you know, and, and it's like rotating. And then, then accidentally by that time, I remember I stumbled upon the first vinyl uh, of Iron Maiden. You know where I found it? In Bumblepity in front of MC on the pavement. Yeah, I bought on Iron Maiden. I bought Iron Maiden vinyl yeah. also at the same place. <laughs> yes. And you know why I bought it? I didn't know it was Iron Maiden. I didn't know what Iron Maiden was back in the day. Right. The only thing I was, it was Life After Death. So yes, Life After Death. Yeah, Life After Death. This blue album vinyl uh, and this grave, you know, shattering, you know, skull coming out of it, you know. Right. And I was so into art. I wanted to buy that. And it, I remember it was like 50 bucks or 60 bucks or something like that. He wanted me to buy about that whole range. But I said, no, I wanted this. So I bought that. I had a vinyl player at home because my dad had bought a vinyl player. It was right. here. And um, I came home and I was more, in, you know, like I was inspired by the art, you know, like I was like showing it to my dad. I was like, hey, it's like yeah, it's pretty good stuff and all that and then I listened to this vinyl and then there's this other sound there's this crazy solos that's and I couldn't imagine that there are this this kind of talent existed you know and then I was like what the hell I've been playing like I felt like the originals that I've been making like wow it's like and then when I read so in the vinyls you have the whole lyrics also then I got mm. to read the lyrics I found lyrics and you know like at that time it was I don't know it was really eye-opener for me you know I think 96 was the game changer for me you know and and then but as fast as I was progressing my band members at that time weren't progressing like that because they were more into you know the you know the Sinhalese music you know and we were doing some Clarence Milton also you know like mm. uh, while we were doing our originals and and then I you know I think that was the base where I started kind of like treating my music, you know, like taking it seriously, like getting to know that, oh, I don't actually do much, you know, like then I had to kind of like think of, you know, that book is not going to help me, you know, explore more unless, you know, like, so then I, then I tried to reach for that sound. Then at the time I had amplifiers, you know, like we had bought some, you know, like collected mm. money from gigs what we could do here and there. And then we started playing at Rock Cafe. Yes, that was one when you in Kolpiti we started, you know. Right. Uh, so we had a slot, uh, a Wednesday slot. So I was schooling at that time. I remember, I, uh, you know, like I used to play, and the next day, you know, like uh, at least one or two o'clock, I would come home, and uh, and that's why, you know, like I had the members and my friends at that time were a little bit more older to me also, who was helping our band, you know. So they right. used to come and like Tilina till is one of our common good friends he basically came and he dropped me off before leaving you know and I remember going to school late <laughs> you know coming into class late and then shifting my you know like I, I wasn't a fan of school you know I, I kind of like really hated school in Sri Lanka you know, like it, was, it was torture for me number one <laughs> and I think I was kind of like a, a goal so back in the day you know like I was like I was moving in the wrong crowd you know in school but when I started playing at commerce days and all that, so all that also kind of like calmed down and and started gaining more respect from the teachers, you know, and staff and all that also right. getting recognition for, okay, he's a musician, you know, kind of. So, but um, I think that's the influence for me, you know, I started changing into metal kind of like the initiation, right. but it took some time, you know, I had to develop my skill, you know, of course. And then we started playing, you know, then by, I remember 96 December and 97, then we were full throttle Deep Purple, well, full throttle, you know, Black Sabbath, mm. you know, Paranoid, like one of the anthems we jammed, you know, like <laughs> over and over again. And still trying to, you know, you know, get that essence of those solos. And um, yeah, I think it was a slow transformation. And then, you know, like, it was the 90s revolution of, you know, rock that was happening, you know, all the right. rock was happening and then, you know, and those kind of influences coming in also, you know. So I'll be listening to like, okay, bands like, as uh, then only I started listening to bands like Metallica, you know, then, in, you know, like getting more explored into that, you know, um, type of music like thrash metal, you know, and, and getting into the death metal aspect. Then I discovered, you know, in 98, 99, I discovered death 
mm. and then was like wow you know like, <laughs> but still i had you know like I, we hadn't seen them like okay we just hearing these things right. we just getting tracks from friends and friends from other schools you know sharing hard drive culture right you know right. like you find something on a hard drive and then mega death wallpapers were like all over like, <laughs> i remember like the desktops of every kid in our school we didn't even know who mega death was but we known them from this you know wallpapers we had of the cover art they had you know right. the albums and all so that was like really weird and then when you get to listen to the music i think for me it was like in 2001 until i had the internet like i discovered you know i started you know getting more familiar with the internet then only i started discovering this stuff yeah. so until then it was just few little hammer magazines you know but you never got to see these people right you never got to see them for us i never got to see them properly mm. whatever i saw was you know like, uh, slash playing sweet child of mine on it and that's only solo you got to see at that time right and and queen you know but discovering bands like iron maiden seeing them kind of like changed everything you know and then it hit me um and also my band members that there's more to it than not just the music and it's a presentation it's it's then then it carved into our hearts like it's not just then when you read about these things you grow up with that culture then you feel, feel like wow it's not about just that like it's also about who you are you know like how you express who you are right so for us it was very eye opening why because it was um, we were going up through war and that music especially you know black sabbath and deep purple and you know ivai heat at that time you know and that you know like kind of like um, gave us more inspiration to go through what we are going through you know knowing right. our friends were dying out you know, like uh, the things you see in news so it was easy to cope up you know and then we made our sound heavy you know and then then only i started really serious and you know conceptualizing you know then i wanted to talk about you know that was that's why we didn't have a i think that's where the foundation for pain came in, you know mm. we wanted to explore what pain was to us growing up in this culture you know so yeah i think um, that's how it started you know that's how it progressed you know by 99 in 2000 we were a heavy metal band you know heavy metal not death metal so not what was the metal. earliest earlier steady lineup uh, i remember you had a very unique setup compared to the other bands you had like two vocalists right earlier like just there were yeah, yeah you and uh, there was another guy who was singing so how how that happened uh, that lineup that happened was yeah that lineup was that's the school lineup but coastal right. was not a mass school he was from a different school he was much more older to us he was a dj actually he was playing in few uh, uh, clubs in colombo colombo 2000 and all that he was a resident dj right. so he so we were gaining popularity you know like uh, because i was singing and there was um, uh, another member uh, uh dan arvind and you know like few there were few singers you know not just me even like even when we were playing comedy it wasn't like we had a you know main singer until kosala uh, you know was introduced to us and he wanted to and he had a naturally he had a great voice he could like he could pitch really high you know and i was very shy to perform vocals i was much more into composing and you know mm. maybe singing was i was very shy to sing until i met him and then we started you know putting our wits together and i started training him in pronunciation english pronunciation because he come he came from a singlish background also he didn't have much of a pronunciation aspect for you know like for english songs so i was fixing that of him and then i was singing along with him and that right. actually improved my vocal you know and that's how it started you know and then we had we had a keyboardist who was from polonnaruwa that was umesh and our drummer was upul he was from my school and we we built the drum kit together in our house you know like that's how we started you know that lineup and we we had a guitarist another rhythm guitarist who was training you know i was training my friends you know all these people were learning from me you know hmm. like um, so until i got uh, upul a slot with arun sirivardhana you know to get him drum classes you know and that was until you know up until 99 2000 only we could you know uh, like organize these things but until then i was like training 
everybody else because I was exploring and learning my instrument and I was even the bass guitarist. I remember we didn't have a bass guitar first, you know, we, we had a box guitar with four strings and that was also from my school, the um, Gayan Milinda. So that was the lineup, you know, uh, our keyboard is from Poland. Now, and we had a strange mix and that's why we went into Deep Purple and all that. So we started, you know, like, uh, Kosala really could sing, you know, like, anything that could you know throw at him he would just i would just then more concentrate on playing guitar and i was just doing backing vocals with him but for originals we basically shared mm. you know like the uh, vocals it was like 50 50 you know like uh, there wasn't like one main vocalist you know so he was more free to run around and that's when we started playing on stage 2001 2002 right. So then we gained a lot of experience, you know, and showmanship and all that, trying to go for these shows, you know. So that's that's the lineup, you know, like that's, yeah. that was the lineup. I think that was the initiation lineup. You know? So then you guys, uh, you guys were uh, like a, uh, quite often you played in the Rock Saturday gigs, right? From the like rock company events gigs. How was that experience? Because I think that's that's kind of first time right that that kind of uh, event started happening that a uh, lot of lot of fans were actually coming in even i came from nigam for those gigs <laughs> those yes, days i remember i remember and they were like even like it was i think it, for me it was uh, I, we kind of like felt really alone you know to be honest you know mm. when we started you know the, our music you know like when we started turning ourselves into hard rock metal and all that i i've seen you know like uh, in mirror and independence square and all that but they were kind of like off reach to us because these were not people that we could hang out or meet up we didn't, mm. like we've seen them we, we've heard about them and even at rock cafe and all that we would meet them but we would never had a chance to kind of like see you know like or to share our stories you know like we felt very isolated mm. until we went to rock until Ajit came in, like I was at this Levi's concert uh, where Orange Street, uh, this Indian band, you know, came. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was at and that then, Yeah. Yeah, so like then I, I met Ajit and then Ajit came and spoke to me and then he was like, you guys are Irving, you, know, you guys have a good sound. I read, then we had some articles going in, you know, in the magazine and all that, you know, Sunday Observer and all these places. So I think we were known to the community and we were... Uh, endorsed by uh, SLBC because that uh, Mr. Harold Fernando from SLBC English Service only first in uh, 1997 uh, basically uh, gave us our first recordings. You know, that's that was our first recording studio at Anand Samarakan Studio. And that right. was made possible by uh, Mr. Harold Fernando. And uh, we were often featured on the Saturday Night Live program and that is how Ajit had got to know about us you know and there we gained a lot of exposure and from there only uh, we did few shows in Rupahini like this format plus they interviewed us you know and then we were making some noise and then only Ajit came in the Levi's concert and spoke to me and mentioned that um, we are reviving rock company I was like what is rock company <laughs> like uh, then he explained to me this is rock company but I remember he he mentioned one gig that I had been to Smoking Rock Circus. I remember 95, yes, 95, 96. I remember going to an art exhibition. I stumbled upon that gig where I first saw Prasanna from mm. Cancer. I saw bands like, you know, uh, Coughing Nails, you know, and, and Tilak Das, you know, like, oh, I saw these guys. But I, like, I didn't know that, you know, like, I'd be spending time with this crowd later. No, I think... After Rock Company was introduced to me by Ajit Tondi, we felt more alive because we saw, we met other bands. We saw other bands just like us who had the same attitude. Like I met Mirshad, I met Suresh, you know, mm. and their band from, from Candy. I was like, what? <laughs> Grunge band from Candy? I was like nuts. When they were playing Nirvana Cows, we were like, oh my God. You know, like we used to headbang. We used to like, that was like 80s club was like, like a mecca for us, yeah. you know? <laughs> I remember we bought, we had to buy the tickets. We had, we bought tickets and walked in, even though we were members. And even the first few gigs even, I remember we bought tickets and went and played on stage. And that is how inspired we were to support a community. Right. That we found that, oh, there, there's a community that exists 
and then ajit is filling my ears with all these stories about the 70s rock company you know about the wall gang network you know and and from how even people from jaffna back in the day were collaborating for rock music i was like what you know <laughs> and i think that that changed our lives you know and it, it you know like i'm meeting all these fellow musicians and that brotherhood was kind of like like a second home to all of us you know we we felt like we belong somewhere you know we felt like we were not alone in what we are doing and and we can actually make a difference you know we can actually make you know like it wasn't like we were on a mission to you know expose rock for us we went like we went sure what kind of band we were the only idea was making original music but after being influenced by all these things and seeing all this band we were like we knew yeah you know like this is our vessel you know metal music whichever sub genre of metal we might evolve into mm. we would know when we join rock company yeah we are going to be a metal band you know and and this is this is our path and it made more evident because we were not alone we were with you know like minded people you know who yeah. thought the same way who kind of like felt the same way and who was going through the same experiences with war and social conditioning and we had people to talk about it you know yes there's a i think uh, rock company days were like a really good uh, influence on me personally and then even the band you know but uh, unfortunately you know like uh, our lineup staying i am the only original member from worldin who still remain you know? so uh, but everybody else around me has changed you know right. and certain decisions i had to make because you know that's why the band is still alive you know like you know to keep it going on an original path you know not to give in to covers and yeah, yeah. So but that I mean, I, was yeah go ahead go ahead but sorry. yeah so i remember uh, going to torana uh, in majestic city and buying your album the vedana album <laughs> it was called vedana right pain yes okay how did that happen that you you recorded with torana <laughs> well this is how it happened um ajit wanted us to record our tracks and we only had few tracks which we had recorded and that was also in the ananda samarpon studio right so when i took to recordings at ananda samarpon studio we you know that's where i got first had the passion to learn sound engineering because uh, there i got my first foundation to record on analog tapes and and surprisingly the crew there was really friendly towards us because they knew the background we came from and um, so uh, doing shows there and all that i showed these recordings to ajit and ajit was like is this you know like you, you guys sound when you are live you sound like monsters what the hell, what the hell are these recordings you know like it's like ajit i'm not a recording artist you know this is what we know and this is what we can do right. so he was like okay uh, you should you know get a record deal you should you know because we were singing single is rock music you know Right. and we had four uh, three metal tracks but we even calling them three metal we in our minds it was like hard rock metal we didn't know like whether what this would be because ajit only basically listened to it and kind of like gave me a foundation like saying you know do more of these you know because you are the only band who can do this you know with this kind of music you know you will actually part you know cover part for other bands you know in the country to kind of like you know be popularized you know and he was right you know and then only he landed the deal with torana he actually called kotalawala mm. and he wanted uh, us to do a audition tape and he told me to give the audition tape not the recordings we recorded at uh, the anand samarpon studio but to put a microphone at our practice studio and just record and give that as a demo actually that was that sounded really heavy that sound you know like we just put one mic mm. where we were practicing in the middle and we had few speakers my for my vocals and all that we recorded it to a small you know our desktop computer and we had an audio file of a set of like one hour or oh, completely original music everything to the bone so that was sent to torana and then suddenly we got a you know meeting with uh, kotalawal and yeah and it took shape you know and then we were given one week one week to record and uh, to 
produce this album and within three weeks they will start printing you know like everything else so knowing what we you know like even so i went to my dad you know like and first told him about it and i gave him the honor of actually drawing the artwork for it so i told him you know like this is the kind of artwork and then we decided you know like we had a song called vedana uh, which was like a very famous track at that time mm. uh, and everybody you know like knew the lyrics you know even though we hadn't put out the lyrics because it was such a catchy sh- song uh, people really loved it you know like and so we kind of like based the concept with pain so we so i gave my dad the idea of you know let's draw the artwork so he compiled the artwork according to what i uh conceptualized and from there we did recordings for one week and we scratched certain songs off and we you know and that happened and but the sound we wanted did not actually come out in the first album you know because we did a mix we took references we took you know like the pantera drum sound and the guitar tones as a reference to this it was mixed by local engineers so you right. have to understand torana uh, was a record label it's a very renowned record label and they were very talented sound engineers but something sri lanka need to learn at that time also we didn't know was you can be a sound engineer but if you don't know the genre of music that you are influenced with no matter how good of a sound engineer you are or technical you have uh, you would not know how to get that sound out so we kind of like did the mix down for pain the whole album with the engineers which kotalawala did not like he was like guitars are too loud drums are like too much compression and you know okay, but this is the sound and even you know like so they disagreed and they told their sound engineers to do you know their version of it which was you know like but i wasn't personally happy with it you know neither are man members also and then um, yeah we had to uh, anyway go with it you know we were paid some sort of money you know like 25000 rupees each for like two weeks time all together 150000 rupees and um, he kind of like uh, got the rights to it you know like all that the you know. so we only own the writing uh, copyrights for it you know the lyrics and all that but the music copyrights for those versions was torana so uh, we we couldn't do much then we were also naive you know like we were learning we didn't know about what a record deal should be like it, you know so we went with that and um, we never even cared about you know taking a sum from the cd sales uh, that's that's our biggest mistake you know we only settled for like uh, 400 copies that was just given to us to do our what a promotion and they printed about 6 7000 cds and uh, they was they sent it all around you know and it was and even cassettes so but i we went happy with the sound they had but then they cut the glass master and they we listened to it and it was like horrible and we we begged we we shouted we argued you know but still you know like they weren't doing it and that's when i decided then and there that i am going to become a sound engineer you know i'm going to become a sound engineer and i'm going to learn this professionally uh so that i can make make my sound you know like so that i don't have to like bend over to any of this you know mediocrity <laughs> and actually learn it properly so then only you know that influenced that so pain that's how pain came out you know and then it was it made a difference you know like we we sold a lot of albums not without even having a single um, you know tv advertisement or any ad you know but we had some good pr going on there were a lot of people in the western music industry who were on newspapers who were journalists who were writing about us you know like tikasa hasan and like so many you know writers who actually wrote about us you know but internet right. even that big on the internet anything but pain was that's how pain started you know and that's that's the round story to that <laughs> <laughs> but it was a big deal huh? because when when i walked into torana you had like clarence milton then whirlwind like on the same shelf right <laughs> yeah yeah it was pretty neat i mean that was the first ever stream metal album you know then only we kind of like named our genre stream metal you know right because after actually after we got the glass master the copy we went and sat with mr ajit because he gave us the deal right so so it was you know like we wanted to kind of like lend this you know like like but we had the our version also we had copied to a cd 
So we gave him that version and he was very happy with that. And then he was also trying to talk to Kotalala to go to the previous sound, which we mixed, but it never happened. But when we listened to it, he was like, man, you guys have a unique sound. And, and then only I wanted to kind of like, you know, this is, I said to him, you know, this is Ajit, this is Sri Metal. This, there are four tracks here in this album and these are the sound of Sri Metal and this will be the sound that we will progress, you know. This will be the sound that we will start working on and more fine tuning and we will improve more. And I was also learning then, you know. Mm. I was, you know, like, like so naive, you know, when it came to, you know, my tones and all that. So, you know, like, I, you know, mostly digital pedals and, you know, like even the tones coming through the amplification, you know, I didn't know how to mic it or whatever. So then came more interesting about it. So it's, it's a big deal. It was a big deal because it was the first Sinhalese rock album ever also, you know, like nobody right. had done a Sinhalese album into that extent, you know. Like, I know there are some people who say, you know, I've done this rock song, or that, but nobody had compiled an album, mm. a conceptual album, you know, like all songs conceptually aligned into a certain uh, idea, you know, and it was based on the influences that we grew up with, you know, and, and, and completely stepping away from mediocre topics like heartbreak, you know, love and all that. We weren't talking, we were talking about war, we were talking about, you know, the repercussions of war, you know, pain, you know, what it means to lose a brother, a sister, and we were talking about abuse, you know, and, and the topics that were really taboo and we wanted to shed light on. We were talking about prostitutes and their mm -hmm. culture and how, you know, like, you know, we talked about all of these things in this album, you know, anything to do with pain in our generation, we kind of like shed light on. It, you know? So it was a big deal. It was a really big deal. And that's, that's how a lot of journalists kind of like, you know, you know, boasted about us, you know, like if there was a band who's talking about this. And that was the time we were getting recognized into the television stations. Mm. And Sirasa, after that, you know, Sirasa started promoting us until they banned us, you know, after Mind Vendor <laughs> <laughs> music video. Um, yeah, then, you know, after we kind of like, uh, when people actually realized what was being told in the album, you know, like even uh, I remember Sirasa, there was this Sati Agasag or some interview. They stopped the interview in like 10 minutes after speaking to us about the album. They were like, you know, I said, like, this is the, this is what the album is about. No, you can't say these things online, like on Naya. It's like, what do you mean? I can't talk about abuse. I can't talk about a dead body that is floating, uh, that what we witnessed floating in the rivers. Right. Murdered, you know, dead bodies. And, you know, like, those are the things I grew up with. So you're telling me not to talk about that song. So then what is there to talk about? Only two songs, you know, like, that was left in the whole album that I could go on and talk about. So, like, those kind of things started happening. So I think, yeah. It, it was a big deal <laughs> for the whole industry. <laughs> Macha, you bring up uh, mind benders. So I think uh, I really, I think that's one of my favorite actually music videos of, you know, Sri Lankan metal bands anyway. So how did, how did that happen? That actually is, is, is in English, right? The, the, the lyrics are in English, right? Completely in English. That was influenced by, okay, uh, we, Okay, that was the first time we kind of like used a proper double twin pedal. And we had a, a drummer, uh, Haraka, at that time, who was playing drums for us. So he, his first, you know, we bought him his first, you know, twin pedal. And he was experimenting with it. And then we had Mindbender. So then this song was completely taking a different drift. And it was in English completely because it was influenced by you know, the seniors in our so-called industry back in the day, you know, like we had a lot of, we had a lot of fights, you know, I'm not kidding. We had a lot of, uh, we exchanged words with some senior musicians who, who, you know, like who, when we went for help, I'm not mm -hmm. going to mention any names here, but you know, like when we went for help, you know, as juniors for guidance, when we went for them for guidance, they turned uh, musicians like us away uh, just because they wanted us to stop playing originals. And there were musicians who told to my face, ah, until, you know, I'm th I've am i been in the industry 30 years, you know, I've only made two originals, you know, I still feel like I have something to learn. I said, yeah, that's you. I only know four <laughs> skills and I go playing the songs with it, you know, that's, that's me. Right. And so if you want to get guidance from people like us, you have to stop playing originals. I said, that's not going to happen. We are known for our originals. And then, you know, like, so with these kind of things happening, so I wanted to bring, shed light on that. <laughs> 
you know, it was happening to us and it was happening to a lot of bands, not just us. It was happening to bands like, you know, Stigma, it was happening to a lot of bands mm. at that time. And it was a topic, you know, like, because all our bands, I remember we were looking for guidance and the only seniors who actually gave a damn was people like Tilak Das, people like Prasanna, people like Ajit Pereira. Mm. And, you know, like, those were the only people who actually shed a light on, you know, like, who, you know, helped us progress, you know, who was there to guide us, man, you know, like, when everybody else, everybody else who were so-called musicians, you know, senior musicians in our country, they completely turned their backs, you know. I don't know for what reason, but we wanted to shed light on it. That's where Mind Bender came in, you know, mending of minds, you know, you know, and influencing, you know, people to let go your passion and to follow, you know, blindly into whatever they've been doing, you know. So that, when we recorded Mind Bend, and that was for the second Rock Company compilation. Right. And uh, so Mindbender was, uh, drums were recorded completely in Torana because we rented the studio because, uh, and then uh, that was the first time I used, you know, like a, a tri we used a trigger also. And we had to do a lot of editing in the drums, uh, you know, like when we brought it to our pool, you know, like when we were doing the mixing in my computer. So there were a lot of cut and paste, you know, like some kicks were off, some cymbals were off here and there. So. Yeah, and we kind of like synthesized the sound also. We we layered some digital kicks also underneath it to make it sound, you know. For me, it was about making a revolution in the, you know, sound. And I that was my first track that I produced by myself, mm. you know. Right. It has I recorded at, at home. And some at Torana, some at home. The solos at Torana, but the rest at home because uh, I had two SM57 uh, and eight mics at that time. So I used that and I, you know, like my the amplification. So it was a turning point for me because that was the first song that gave me confidence that, okay, there was nobody else to go to, you know, nobody else who knew the sound, who would do the songs the way we wanted to do it. So Mindbender was the first track that I got to produce for work. So I did that. So when that happened, uh, song after the compilation gained completely, you know, like huge popularity in the live stage and and because the compilation was going really wild and everybody was listening to it and then uh, my good friend uh, manu ranga who's a famous lyric writer and a and a writer right now back in the day you know came to me and said masan let's do shall we do a music video i was like i was not so keen about it then. i was like okay how do you want to do it <laughs> like uh, yeah, if you find me a camera i, I will direct it you know like so I was like, oh, okay, then we watched some music videos, you know, whatever we could, you know, mega death and stuff like that. But we didn't have money to get. So Ajit lent me his uh, our company video camera to do the video. So, <laughs> and all of our fans, I remember when we mentioned that we are planning on doing a video, uh, about close to, yeah, about 30, 40 of our fans actually came, helped us. Yeah, they gave us the location. They carried our instruments to the top of a rooftop of a building. And they were there. They drew, the, like we had an idea to draw a star because we had five members then. So we want to place each member in the, in the tip of the stars, you know. So, but uh, later it was translated by some other people when it went on there. We are a satanic band. But <laughs> we, we just put star. We didn't, we wanted to put a pen to them, but we didn't hold the idea because we, we, we are not a religious band. You know? right. We don't talk about, you know, we take, keep off that topic. Even if it's Satanism, it's another religion to us and we don't care about it. You know, like we, that is something that we don't talk about, you know, because, uh, and we don't try to, you know, create more conflict because we try to bring people together with music, you know, and also we have our values, you know, anything that separates people from each, you know, from all of us, kind of like topics like this, religion is something that we completely stayed away from, you know, so we weren't supporting any religion, like, at all, even if it was Satanism, not at all, so, mm. so we made this music video, we put it out, my friends edited it from school, um, they both put it together, so it happened because of fans, and that's, it, it wasn't the best music video, but that was the first ever music video for heavy metal music in our country, yeah. you know? that was the first, nobody had ever had done that. So I think that was good because it happened because of fans. It happened because of people who were inspired by the music, like Ajit, you know, and, and everybody was there. So I think that that was the main deal for us. And, and 
that song being something that we produce and gave us confidence like wow and this is how you build an industry you know this is how an industry is born you know like i was fortunate enough to actually witness that to see how you know bands and and most of the fans were members of other bands also you know yeah. <laughs> who came there to help us out you know it was pretty cool man and i think that something i'm very fortunate enough to have witnessed i didn't, i know even in other cultures you would never get to witness that we were there when this industry was giving birth with you know that first initial you know steps and we saw how people came together and you know helped each other right. and that is what we that why we are still alive that's why as a band we are still moving forward is because of people who are inspired us you know and still continue to do so yeah maja what happened to your you, you guys put up uh, i i was actually listening to it even today the the next album agony which uh, which uh, to me it sounds very raw and it's yeah. i mean that's probably like why i i like it and then this song that you written uh, falling down the, yes. the the slow song what's the story behind that song because that's really a very personal feeling when you listen to that falling down was one of the i think the most melodic song we have up to date and it's very personal because it talks about you know breaking free from social condition right and acceptance from society you know like i grew up in a society where like i loved growing long hair since i was a kid not because i wanted to be a musician even when i was in dubai i loved long hair like you know like and 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 being that way that was the first you know and then growing up in a culture like you know like for me when i go out right now even i have my the chains in my wallet you know like mm-hmm. i'm 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 same as how i go on stage bro right. like it's been like that like that was we i was judged for that you know places that i had to go to work places of you know when i studied even sound engineering mm. when i was even training uh, you know like when i was as a instructor when i was training uh, digital media to people i was facing i was going through some really shit times because of how people looked at me and judged me so i think that kind of like was the main reason that i wanted to write that because i it was not just me man it was like uh, there was a whole generation who grew up with me felt the same way you know like we can't go in a bus we get stares mm. and even if like we were looked down upon like drug addicts like you right know, like, you had long hair you are a kudda here you are a drug addict <laughs> that's what that's yeah. wrong, you know i like but you know like the pretty boys you know you know like they are the ones who are the same so, you know like we were always you know like even that's why the, i think in the first part we didn't even like in sri lanka normally we won't have chicks following us you know even if you're in a rock band because you are the persona is completely different you know? <laughs> like they get really scared when they look at us you know like right, like right. bikes and you know like the bangles what we wear and and the yeah, afters you know like the tattoos and all that so i i felt that song was kind of like a um uh that was that song was dedicated to embrace the goth culture i should say because i'm i'm a goth fan you know like i there's a reason why we are black you know i kind of like my whole existence and is a protest to the system you know because i don't do you know the world wind is not just a band it's not something that i earn money from it's not my livelihood you know i have to mm. say that you know it's something that is being done for fashion and we have strict ground rules in when it comes to you know we walk the talk anything that we say on these songs and all that and that is who we are and it's not something we are trying to do to become rock stars rock stars is the last thing i want to become i don't even care about it it's not when we go on stage the only thing we believe is for me personally is not it's to stand up to the man you know stand up to all this corruption you know and to know to show people that we see the corruption to show people that we acknowledge it and we stand against it you know and we go out there to influence that you know and still people are divided you know mm. so we for me falling down was that song to showcase who who the hell we really are you know this is what you see what you get you under your skin this is who you are you know and although you have even if you go to prison and and let's say you pay for the things you have done even if you have done mistakes even you 
come clean with those mistakes still people would not appreciate you for who you are I had friends who went to prison for smoking a joint you know and when they came out of prison you know after four or five days i saw how the society started changing their perspective about these people right i mean you know like those kind of things was the highlight for that so that that's why it's very emotional also because this melody it's about you know it's about falling down from every aspect it's that's all i do it's, it's falling down from the whole conditioning you know it's mm. actually letting go like i choose to fall away from all these things it's, it's a a statement so yeah that's the background for falling down you know? <laughs> yeah it's a really nice song there's one more song that i really like and then i saw you you did the horizon of city j right the you also yeah. have an unplug version of that um but i yeah. saw this performance your it's a small clip that that uh, that's in facebook uh, it's floating around facebook you guys performing to a smaller crowd uh that song <laughs> it's so i don't know that's uh do you remember where was that perform performed it was like very crazy yeah <laughs> where was uh, what is this uh, song you are talking about it's I think horizon is it horizon or city j right city j i it's from last year there's this from a concert from last year rock saturday last year i think that's what you're referring to it's a small oh, clip right oh body clip yeah. like it's all, it's uh yeah <laughs> i think that That's really, really brings uh, that really brings out what whirlwind is for me actually <laughs> when i see see that you know how the crowd is reacting uh, to to your yeah. singing <laughs> that was that was a pretty insane gig i have to say it was a really tight space crnsc mm-hmm. sports club very tight space and the place was packed and there was a mosh pit just behind that there was a huge mosh pit that was going on and the place was packed i remember there was a crowd outside also and the best part about it is like now uh, i don't know everybody knows our lyrics you know like even even the newer songs you know we haven't put in lyrics out or anything we don't even have lyric videos you know right. but people know the lyrics especially after we did the acoustic version it became more um, you know people started you know listening to it more and especially when they started realizing it it's it's about you know like that song is about adrenaline it's about drugs it's about how 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 you know like how you break free from you know an addiction it's always about addiction it's about yeah. the addictions of drugs sex uh, every type of addiction you know and how it leads to uh, a horizon it's an illusion you know that something that you will never reach right you know so it, so i think because of that also i think it has become the most famous track of all time of world you know so it's really good energy every time when we play it because the crowd goes really wild for it and they know the lyrics and you can hear them you know like roaring the lyrics you know and it's a pretty good feeling you know and i never thought i'd see the day you know like we did have that kind of a audience in this country but uh, surprisingly since our comeback in 2016 we took a small break you know mm. from 2012 to uh, 2016 so since 2016 i think the concert you came to was our you know like the comeback come back and ever since yeah ever since we've been headlining every gig that we headlining every gig and the crowd has been growing more and more you know and now it's like phenomenal growth you know like it's pretty crazy that song has a lot of energy man i think that's what people like because it's something that we all go through addiction you know like i'm 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 not being a saint here you know i was addicted to a lot of drugs you know i had that time period and um, i i came out of it not just me you know like you know, members ex members and all that you know we explored these things you know like we i'm not trying to say we went since you know like we explored all these things you know we that came right. our way you know like we were heavy boozers and uh, it was it's it was part of our culture i mean like we embraced it you know smoking a joint at a gig is like something we always did you know but um, surprisingly thing since we started came back you know in 2016 we never got on stage high mm. so all the gigs we played since our comeback you know one thing we managed to do was like we like we don't need any of that thing you know go on stage now it's pretty neat i'd say you know like i never thought i'd see the day me performing without having a sip of liquor but now the drinking is done after the performance you mm. know because now kind of like i feel like the high comes from the music itself and you are in a different state of mind when you're on stage you know and you're right. more connected you know you're more aware than how i was you know back in the day i'm 
know, especially since we took the break and came, we have all evolved to music in a different perspective, especially me, because I've expanded my ideas and my technicalities completely after that break. I took time to produce other music. So I think like when you say that song that, you know, that's where the energy comes into that song, you know, with all that inspiration, you know, and now I think the crowd is feeling us more than how we used to be. You know, I feel that, you know, I feel more connected to the audience, you know, and especially when we sing songs like, you know, Horizon, you know, I think that's where the energy comes from, you know, it's an exchange mm -hmm. of energy. It's it, in that particular group, you would have seen like the audience is just on top of us, you know, it was so packed. I didn't have space to even normally, I would make few moves running <laughs> here and there with my guitar. I could I can hear there's Tandu and here there's Tanki and his huge paddle board. So I had to be very careful where I step, you know, and then the mic is being constantly pushed, pushed yeah. you, know, you know, to me, but still it was, you know, and then some fans trying to keep the mic stand steady, you know, and all that. It's a good feeling. I think that's what, you know, the whole community is about, right? That's what this whole thing is about, you know, like metal music, it's, that's why metal music stands out from above all the other genres for me, yes. the unity. Connection, you know, the energy, you know, like you don't share something like this on any other stages. Trust me, I go to festivals, you know, <laughs> I like there's no other place like a mosh pit, man. Seriously, there's no other place like that. Yeah, I think uh, because of this uh, pandemic and, you know, I, I think one thing I really miss is the mosh pits, actually. <laughs> oh, man, talk about it. We miss hanging out and, shit, you know, like even jamming, we miss that now. We can't yeah. even jam now. So, so Misha, what's the what's the now what's the current lineup of Whirlwind? Well, the current lineup right now of Whirlwind is um, Chandu um, is on bass, and uh, Chand, I think Chandu joined me, you know, like uh, just after we uh, finished off Mindbend and all that. So when Vijay and then we had a bassist called Ranga, then mm. uh, Chandu was our um, fourth bassist, and um, Chandu is playing bass now, and Chanki uh, Chanaka uh, from Soul Skinner. So mm. He uh, he and Esho joined the lineup uh, in 2007 together, and then I was uh, completely on vocals. You know, we had another guitarist and all that. But now it's Chanki on lead guitar, um, and we have a new drummer, which is the youngest <laughs> now mm. uh, band, uh, Crescent. You know, uh, who's also you know started back in 2000. And, well, you know, like his initiation for metal music. And uh, so we had to choose a drummer because we had to, you know, let Nesho go. Uh, mm. That's because of family and, and you know, like mm. other things in life, you know, coming into play. So, so we decided when, that's why we didn't make a comeback, you know, like even after 2012, I went to Europe. I got, you know, like I was married at that time. So mm. I was touring in Europe. I was touring with another project of mine. So I took that time to kind of like let the band also evolve and you know, and then when I came back uh, since 2016, so it's been this lineup actually, um, except for the drummer, this lineup with Nesho was there since 2007, you know, dead straight, you know, mm. he never made any line since 2007. But in 2016, we had to, you know, let Nesho go and get Crescent on board. And I think now, see, with every lineup change, your sound changes, you know. Not the ideas, but the the things that you bring into the flow. I think the sound right now has evolved. Right. So right. have we, I think. Uh, so. so this is the lineup we have right now. Yeah, because... I say it's a pretty cool lineup. Yeah, because when I, when I saw you in 2016, uh, I had that feeling that I'm watching a veteran band of Sri Lanka, right? <laughs> like, like that feeling that you really had a distinctive uh, performance and even you personally, I think, have grown. Your stage presence was right. Uh, I was kind of thinking that Whirlwind is more like you. I'm watching like a Motorhead concert, like you kind of yeah. had that vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, really, really, it's uh, I, it's really amazing, yeah. actually. <laughs> Thanks, man. Because it's it's actually it's really nice to hear somebody like you saying it. Because like you, I mean, you have more experience. You know, watching so many bands. You know, like being, I think you have a huge experience behind you. You know, like right. when it comes to bands, when when somebody like you, you know, like says that, 
it's a huge compliment. Thank you. <laughs> so, Misha, you. I, but I work. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. No, but I but I had to work for it. You know, like it wasn't like stage presence and all that. It's it's not something you know. Like I focused on it. You know, more and with the guitars and all that. You know, it's uh, like I kind of like changed my tonalities also. I think that helps and the tuning also helped. You know, like our, the tuning also kind of like gets more comfortable. Mm. So all these things actually play a part. You know, that's what I realize now is that to feel comfortable on stage. You know. Uh, you know, even having this uh, guitar, you know, everybody asked me, why do you play with that Jackson? Why don't you want to play with I said, that's the only guitar that I can play with while doing vocals. You know? I have other guitars that I play, but I can't never play that on Virgin because the things, you know, it, I can't have anything, you know, in between, you know, like mm -hmm. I need to have little, the guitar a little bit, you know, down for me to be comfortable. I think I focused on those things. I, I focused on making myself comfortable on stage, you know. I think that helps, you know, to improve everything. So that's the science that I'm kind of like, you know, like I'm teaching a lot of my students also, you know, like it's about, it's not just about, you know, looking good out there or, or, or you know, wearing black or anything. No, it's about being yourself, you know, and most of all, comfortable. Mm. If you're not comfortable to play your instrument and if the instrument, if you are in control of the instrument and the other things, you know, none of these chains or my hair or any of these things get in the way of my performance. It only helps me perform. Right. Ever since I started embracing those things, it has become more easy. I think, uh, like that's why you feel that way because I'm more connected on stage right now, and that's mm. not something that I plan on doing because of the pre-planning, the pre-production for it is when you practice, even when at, at, when we practice for our gigs for all of our band members. That's how it is. You know, like we we keep the lights down, we turn off the fan because we know. We don't, we don't practice in the air condition. Even if you're in the air condition room, you'll turn it off. We, we want to feel like we're on stage. We want to sweat. You know, we want our you know, guitars to get sweat by the, you know, mm. like we want to be comfortable. So I think that uh, kind of like pre-production, what we use at for our gigs kind of like gives way that you are more comfortable on stage. Like it's like you're in the practice studio, you know. Only thing is you have some more friends in front of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, I noticed that you do a lot of, uh, you know, sound production and stuff. So can you tell me a little bit about your solo work? Like on, well, on that end? Solo work. Uh, I have, uh, what I do is I have another project, um, which I started back in 2012. It's a, uh, it started off as a psychedelic um, live mm. project. You know, I use a lot of, you know, analog synthesizers. I use a lot of, uh, you know, like, uh, analog equipment for it as to say you know like uh, so i wanted to create a project that i could accompany with my instruments i also play with a percussion in it you know and um, so so it's like keyboards guitar and like uh, it's all together so it's a live project so i when i started that in 2012 i had the chance to perform in you know like huge festivals in, in europe you know and it's completely original music and it it's catered to a different you know, market Mm -hmm. But I do have to say I've been doing uh, sound research because I was a sound engineer. I was doing a lot of sound research into sound design. And that was kind of like my inner passion, you know, something that I kept to myself. And in 2012, when I kind of like left the country to Europe, you know, to do this type of music, I wanted to embrace it more. So I was studying a lot of um, so figure scales, you know, like I was into it, but I'm not, I didn't, want to use it practically, you know, mm. uh, some call it healing music, I call it organic music, you know, and uh, explore the tuning like 432 hertz tuning, you know, and um, because we were, we grew up tuning our instruments to 440 hertz, you know, like E440, you know, we never knew what 432 was until, you know, like we stumbled upon this research for me personally, and then I started exploring it and, you know, like gaining more knowledge about it and, and, um, since I was a sound engineer, the passion for me was wherever I go, I had my laptop, you know, I would record sound effects. Like, you know, mm. Because for main rule you learn as a sound engineer, sound designer is, if it's something that inspires you, you will record it, even on a phone, wherever. So I have a huge sound bank that I still this day kind of like maintain by recording different samples. So, and I combine this with uh, um, like, um, so figure scales, and uh, the tunings and uh, I 
then you know more in depth you know research into plant based you know sound research so how do you use frequency and sound to heal at the same time uh, accelerate you know the growth of plants you know in terms of like seed germination how you can increase that so i worked with uh, i worked with few uh, non profit organizations you know uh, like new work project and humanitad hmm. uh, so because of that you know like they wanted to explore my knowledge of that and i started implementing more styles into this so the idea was to take my music to normal uh, electronic dance floor you know and kind of like see that energy because when you go to these places you know a lot of these people are on all kinds of substances psychedelics you know whatever mm-hmm. you know like either like they are on something that gives an advantage for us if you handle the frequencies you are able to kind of like uh you know move the audience you know to your liking you know and to give them a good experience you know right. uh, to kind of like explore so that's something that's what was i tried you know exploring with sound design so spirited the project you know was mainly based on that to create uh, like not genre less music not to just stick to one particular genre to have a flow with genres and mm. yet to kind of like occupy these kind of dance floors and i did have a marketing plan also because i wanted to earn money from it uh, i i did it mainly because to earn money because it was a target audience and that was a music style that was a uh, uh actually you know a lot of musicians producers were making money uh, you know especially playing live and it's one thing you would find lacking on these kind of stages is a person who is actually playing everything live so mm. back in 2012 for me i got a lot of good exposure because i was playing with all these instruments live and alone and then i had few more members that i collaborate when i travel and so this kind of music you know that actually expanded me you know like i started looking at music in a different perspective so uh, i've collaborated i've done about six albums now with that project and i've collaborated with uh, authors uh, healing artists and from all around the globe you know and um, so i'm making you know and i have my own record label which is inspired by the project itself there were, then i found out there's so many people who wants to have the same guidance you know like um, what we were like using for that project and more people you know from the metal community and even the rock community wanted to come and you know explore these things mm. so so then i wanted to help these projects also then i was helping and helping and then i had a, then i had my friends helping out help these bands so then eventually we started a record label you know called spirited records right and now that is kind of like spread it around you know like it's a it's a very free form of a label it's not like you know like a label music label like we don't stick to the normal uh, guidelines of that you know anybody can be in a label and still be in other labels you know like we don't hold like right we don't have hold on our artist because the whole idea of the project spirited and all that is to kind of like not to you know like you know, it's all about sharing you know it's all about not having any bonds but we have only is like in more use if we have a contract with another artist it's like you know like we take a percentage of their sales and we would do their cover artwork and we would handle their image or we would guide them or we would do some tutorials to create the same music that you know like they want to follow the same idea and on most of our music is on creative common license you know like in mm. spirited music i copyrighted it um because it's it's like free mostly i give it away free and even in bandcamp uh you can pay what you want and that's how i make most of the money because people download the music and they listen to it they experience it and they pay sometimes more than the value if i you know like if i put just you know, two dollars or whatever for a song you know like it will be that limit you know here people who are inspired you know have some people who have bought the album a few times you know and i've got good results and i've got a huge fan base right now in europe and the label is also expanded so that's that's what i do you know like so i explore it's now it's very extreme music you know like i have like a lot of extreme uh, artists also and you know like uh, this genres like forest dark sigh goes up to like 400 bpm kind of music it's like really trippy and really sound design wise it's a, it's a different culture of music subculture of music and um, it's you know like it's actually helping me evolve as a musician 
I think uh, even it has helped Whirlwind evolve a lot uh, because even my other guitarist, you know, also has a similar project on an electronic project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He collaborates with a lot of electronic artists. So I think, I think that's why it comes, you know, like we kind of like stay true to who we are and still explore other realms and gain experience, you know. And uh, like, I think that's, that's one way to be rock and roll, right? You do what you want. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know, so... Yeah, that's what I do. You know, like that's 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 the other part of you know the project. So right now the project has evolved. You know, spirited project has evolved to a live project. So we have a basis, we have dancers. You know, like it's like a you know like projector mapping that has come into play. You know, so it's a conceptual Broadway kind of performance. You know, uh, right now that's where it stands. You know, and it has evolved into that level. So we kind of like want to give people a different experience. You know, so our target audience mainly is the European market. You know, but it's not like we stick to that. It's just because we have more fans there and we get more festivals and it's easier for us to organize gigs there. But we are planning some tours in India, you know, after this pandemic is over. We, we were supposed to go on tour this year, like in Europe and here. But uh, yeah, COVID basically <laughs> dismantled all those plans, you know. So yeah, so hopefully next year we'll be going on tour again, you know. Like I've been touring since 2012 with that project, you know, it's been right. amazing. So, yeah, that's that's that. <laughs> I I just want to show you something. Yeah. You remember this one? Siblings of hatred. That's <laughs> another project I collaborate with. Yeah, yeah, you work with them, right? Well, I actually. Uh, excuse me. Give me one second. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> sorry, bro. I had to open the door for a friend. Sorry. Uh, uh, I work with them like this. See, um, I started. I'm a big fan of Siblings yes. of Hatred. I, okay, I'm a big fan, and Michael and I go way back. <laughs> okay, <laughs> from Rock Company days, and even before Rock Company days, potluck. You know, like uh, standing hold. You know, like we knew each other from those days. Kind of like we had a bond going. And with Pinto. And um, so I kind of like started working with them because there was a time where their band was kind of like getting a little bit of uh, negative feedback mm. for what they were doing. And uh, the practice studio, they were practicing in Rock Company. Uh, some few bands decided that Satanic Band should not practice in the Rock Company studio. Whereas that's where I kind of like left Rock Company back in the day because the idealisms and all those things, you know, changing. Uh -huh. and, so then I gave Siblings of Hatred our studio to come and practice. And ever since I've been like a more huge fan. And uh, I collaborated with them in uh, 2015. Uh, the last gig they played uh, because Dan wasn't playing guitars anymore. Right. And um, so Bento came and asked me, you know, like we're looking for guitars and you know, can you, could, can you, could you help, help out? So I was like, looking for people, but I couldn't find anyone who I could you know, pick them in. So they were running late for a deadline. So Pinto was asking me, would you, wouldn't you mind playing? I was like, I don't mind playing if you don't mind. And like, he was like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, like, and uh, <laughs> I didn't think you'd play beyond, you know, Whirlwind. I was like, no, it's not like that, you know, like, and anyway, at that time, Whirlwind was not a play, 2015. Right. So I was like, yeah, man, let's do it. And we had a good time, you know, like we had a really good time. I, and even uh, right now, I'm actually composing some songs for them. You know, like uh, they're making a huge comeback, I think, which is also stuck because uh, of this COVID, you know, situation. Right. We're supposed to release, you know, uh, the original, and we are coming up with a new logo. And I'm part of Siblings of Hatred also as a guitarist, you know, playing part as a guitarist, and also some backing vocals for them. So we have created some new material, you know, like it soon come out, you know. So Pinto's like family now, you know, like, this is, it's like, <laughs> like, you don't have this band scene anymore. Like it's there, it's like whirlwind, you know, whatever, like it's just a one huge family, you know, like right. Pinto still to this day comes for all the gigs, you know, he's been like a fan of like everything. I, I've got into more music because of Pinto. I got to know Cradle of Filth because of Pinto. Right. Because he came for guitar lessons. The only way he could pay me was he said, I'm paying you with CDs. <laughs> 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 He gave me the first damnation and a day. He got that album. He's like, brother, you're going to love this. And 
ever since I was like in love with you know like so siblings of hatred now it's one band that I'm I'm proud to be a part of and you know like I'm also a big fan of you know like, uh, yeah really cool. and the first black metal band in the country yeah? right so Misha uh, what's what's uh, what's next for Elvin what's happening next for Elvin well next for Elvin is uh, the third album um, that's on the way the music is being composed it's already composed it's like need to be recorded and there are few three music videos that we have working progress you know but all this got to a halt because of covid but we are trying to kick things back up you know as soon as we can like i said you know with whirlwind it's not like it's our live livelihood you know like each of us like everybody in the band you know like except for our drummer everybody else is a full time musician Chandu is a full time musician Chanki is a full time musician and they also have a cover a project that they do that I also help them out with you know like do some cover music to get some money you know and all that you know because they are full time musicians right but even all that are stuck. so see what what I do with other projects I fund Whirlwind with it you know it's not like we have sponsors right you know so everything is what we earn from other projects we put into Whirlwind you know to our passion because that's why it stays free you know it stays you know unconditioned you know from anything you know or influenced by any sponsors that we can still freely you know talk about the topics we talk about you know so next is that and few music videos that is on hold because of the situation that we can't meet up still uh, like frequently like because our meeting times are late in the night early morning when we have no deadline like that you know so it's hard for us because of the curfews to kind of like be free like that and of course we you know like when we meet up we have smokes we drink and all that and these days it's not a good time to you know like do any of this stuff you know like with the law and all that it's like bullshit right. you know so we try to like i always believe you know virgin is a natural you know the name itself is a natural phenomenon it's not planned so i we let virgin happen on its own you know mm. like we all have a priorities but at the same time whirlwind is also a priority but we kind of like let it flow you know like we all have this feeling at a time we know like we are aware we are aware that in the industry we can't perform anywhere so that's why we are individually developing our skill sets improving the songs that we already have kind of like you know making little bit of tweaks you know places where we feel like ah oh, we could change this and you know like we do that so the third album is the main thing we need to do so i think that hopefully we'll finish recording this year and uh, we're looking at maybe releasing maybe next year we were supposed to do it this year but everything fell apart so we don't want to push things forward and i don't want to use a pandemic to kind of like promote our mm. music because we've been telling about these kind of so called pandemics and you know all this conditioning that will arise in the future with our music you know with the album again so uh, that's why we don't uh, use this time to even come out and showcase our talent right now or anything like that because no it's not the time for that person right. that's what we believe because we are not that band where you will see like we go to a practice studio and you will see a selfie of us no we don't do that we don't even we haven't even taken a selfie of our band members together ever like that you know <laughs> unless we've been photographed somebody else no it's not in our like it's not part of who we are you know like right. we, you know talk like we like to walk the talk you know and we like to keep it very minimum you know like we we are, we are not that kind of you know that type of band you know? like we hold those things very dear to us you know so we let the music speak you know for it you know we don't kind of like have ah we are coming soon with this so we not do those kind of things it's like we do an album we put it out we do a music video you know there'll be no trailers or previews or anything like that it's just it's just coming out you know like that so once so it's like that's next for world win third album is the main thing for world win i think that's something we worked so hard especially me and tanki right. like the past few years we have been working so hard to compile the music to kind of like develop the music because there's a lot that goes into making that music because it's more singhali space it's more stream metal tracks so and we try to because recently we got featured in in a um, um, few other countries and few other radio stations um in um, we have that online i can't remember this radio stations uh, rock uh, that some radio station in barcelona it's a metal station so they featured us they actually featured all the stream metal tracks from the second album 
Mm. And they were singing lyrics on it. And they were so intrigued. One thing on that interview, what they was talking about was how interesting to hear Sinhalese. Because you will hear French, you will hear all the other languages, but Sinhalese is a language that you will not get to hear on a metal, you know. You know. And when you have English lyrics intertwined, they kind of like, at the end of the day, get the meaning of right. the, you know, track. So that was something good for us. So we started kind of like putting in more time for that. So that's what we're planning this year. So to work with the tracks, to make the tracks feel more homely. And even there are a few other um, languages that will come in, even some German, even, you know, like uh, some Sanskrit, you know, old uh, Sanskrit, you know, uh, you know, in the lyrics. So we're planning it out properly. And it takes a lot of time to plan these things out. You know, it's not just about making the music. It should be things more, even technicality should be able to play on stage, especially for me. I should be able to perform while singing and, and manage the energy throughout. So all this, right. right now we put all these things. So this is what we're doing right now, actually. And the last few years, we've been actually planning the songs and every song we put out has worked out so well with the audience and we test it out in the audience. Like after one or two performances, the audience even know the lyrics. You know? mm. That's how strong it is. And that's how we know that formula works. So this is what world in up to right now, actually formulating, you know, perfecting our formula. And uh, we don't consider, you know, doing album after album, you know, like we like to make something more memorable for us, you know, like actually for us, we play the music mainly not for the fans or friends. It's for us, you know, it's our satisfaction. So we like to make it perfect for us. And then I know uh, we can share with our friends. We don't have fans. We have friends. <laughs> we have <laughs> yeah. very small and, and every, all the, uh, fans so called we have our friends our brothers our, anybody who I know like I know all of them and I'm, I think it's, it's a really nice community so that's what we have planned for you know the next you right. know adventures uh, we're working Misha you anybody you want to shout out to Misha ah uh, I want to shout out to I don't know if Ajit you know like uh, all the all the local bands here like I want to make a shout out to them you know like uh, Actually, the bands who are actually making, you know, like bands like Paranoid Dirtling, bands like Stigmata, bands who are still playing the game, man, you know, like uh, still in the game, you know. Yeah. And not, a lot of people started off with us, you know, like like all, all good brothers, you know, like I want to shout out to all the guys who are still at it, you know, like Siblings of Hatred, you know, like still, you know, like, you know, like Funeral in Heaven, you know, like the bands that were there and they're still kicking ass, you know. And uh, it's not easy, especially being in our country uh, without an industry for Western music properly and uh, putting everything you have. So I want to make a shout out to all the uh, people who are still in the game in this country, still in the industry that we are building and who is still not given up, you know. Mm. And I know all of these members will still keep fighting for it. And that's, that's, one, that's the only shout out I will have. And the members of all of these bands, you know, who are still doing it and the new generation who's inspired by us and who's right now doing music and who's, I hope they continue. I hope they have the same, you know, journey as us, even much more better, you know, like, you know, like. so I want to shout out to all those bands in the country right now, in this country, because um, for us, this is our home and we don't, you know, like, it's not my, you know, vision to play Vakan one day. I don't, that's not my dream. My vision is to, you know, build a Vakan in Sri Lanka. That's mm. my vision. You know? <laughs> that's what I want to do, man. Nicely put. You know, so, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, like, you know, it's not like if the opportunity arises, we wouldn't play. It's not like, you know, we try to be realist, you know. For me, I think that's more important than uh, especially people like Tilak Dias, Ajit, and you know all the you know Harold Fernando, you know like Priyanjit Vijayshekar, these kind of uh, humble uh, individuals who actually still to this day supports us. You know? And without them and our friends, not fans, our friends, we would be nowhere. Mm. Because our, our fans are our friends. You know that's every fan is a friend. That's right. how we see their brother. Without our brothers, so the shout out goes to all of them because we today do this because of all of you all. Not because we get paid for doing it, because this is the inspiration, this is the payment, you know, to see people doing it, to see another band come up, to see another band 
today, like if you see like, wow, there's another metal band. Hell yeah, we've done our job. <laughs> you know? That's what we do this for, you know, it's not for money. Yeah. So that's a shout out. Man. And to you, especially, you know, and I know you're doing an amazing job with the blog. It's really nice. You know, you're yeah. getting some interesting people, you know, it's pretty good. And I'm really proud the Sri Lankan is doing it. No, I think you should be, you should have started this way back, you know, <laughs> with the experience yeah. you have. I think you should really continue this, you know, and I'm pretty sure you're going to get more interesting and more pretty good, you know, guys onto this, you know, show. And uh, anything you need, man, from us, like you, we will always have our support for anything that we can, you know, anything what we can do. Like we always support these things and I'm really proud of Sri Lankan is doing a program like this. It's, it's about yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. Out, man. <laughs> so Misha, thanks man for doing this. Uh, really looking forward to the new uh, album. So stay safe. Uh, keep making music. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, I send you lots of good vibes and love, you know, to your family. You know, like uh, I love the pictures you post, man. I see you live a really nice, you know, blessed life, you know. And, yeah. and you have everything passionate around you. It's so great. And all the concerts you visit, you know. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really intriguing to see all this. So good luck, man. Good luck with the blog, you know. And um, anything you need, you know, like anytime. Yeah, we are always here. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thank you. I go on. I go on. <laughs> I'm around pain, I just fall